And it is not surprising that the name of Seth would be associated to true worship, seeing that Seth was given by God as a son to Adam and Eve to replace whom? To replace Abel. Abel. The righteous Abel who had brought a sacrifice pleasant to the Lord. Clearly, Seth and his lineage continue the spiritual heritage of Abel, a spiritual heritage of genuine, genuine worship. But now if you turn to the other line, the other side, that of Cain, Adam, looking at his offsprings, experienced something quite different about the human lineage which came out of him and Eve. This line is not given to us in as many details as the other one. The number of their life years is not mentioned. And we hear only about a few links. We could say that they are more characterized by their contributions to human civilization. But this is not surprising either, seeing that the nature of Cain's sacrifice was to gather and bring products from the earth which he had managed to grow himself and which he was proud to display before the Lord as if the earth had not been cursed by the Lord. Thus, uh, we see that um, uh, uh, Cain uh, uh, bore Enoch and uh, after that, we read in verse 17, he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his own son, Enoch. He's a builder of cities, of human cities. And later, the builders of the Tower of uh, Babel will pull together all their strength with the same motive as he seems to have had, to remain united, not to be lost in the exile, not to be... Uh, 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 given over to the painful consequences of his exile on earth, they will pull together all their strength with the same motive, to remain united, not to be scattered throughout the earth and to feel like exiles. Same mentality, same mindset. But when you read with a little bit of attention this text, which perhaps we don't always do because we go through it as if it was just a a list of names, we notice that uh, the names of this line, of Cain's line, are the same. Uh, some people have got the same names as people that we find in the line of Seth. Look, the son of Cain is called by him Enoch. And this is exactly in Hebrew the same spelling as the Enoch that was taken up to heaven. In the line of Cain, we find a certain Metushael. In the line of Seth, we have a certain Metushela. It's close enough. And later, there comes also a Lamech with the same spelling as the Lamech who fathers Noah. Thus, we have people with similar names. They come from the very same first couple. They are part of the same humankind. They beget children. They live on the same earth and experience the same pain and toil. However, when you start comparing what the two Lamech said respectively, you quickly realize how sharply their attitude towards life differed. Within the line of Seth, the re he who replaced Abel, Lamech, the father of Noah, acknowledges the reason for the toil and pain which characterize life on earth. God cursed the earth and Lamech knows well what, why it was so. He knows it because he would have received it 
from the line of Seth, generation after generation, it would have been transmitted to him. A covenantal line where what has happened, God's judgment has been conveyed. It was because of the sin of his forefathers, Adam. But still, he sees the grace of God at work in his own life with the birth of a special son, Noah. He retains for himself and his family a perspective of hope. He yearns towards the liberation from a miserable condition. Everything in what he says shows, even though it's just one single small sentence in the Bible, but everything shows that he calls upon the name of the Lord as in the time of his ancestor Seth. Now, now turn, let's turn to the other lineage and to the other Lamech, the descendant of Cain. This one, this one clearly walks on the criminal pathway of his forefather. This Lamech is proud about the fact that his ancestor built a city. He therefore calls one of his sons with a name that will keep this memory and heritage, heritage alive. Tubal Cain. Cain had worked out the earth and built a city. Tubal Cain will invent tools made of metal and he will bring further development in the world. Of course, out of these tools, you can also build weapons. Brilliant engineers will come from the lineage of Tubal Cain. Brilliant people, but also very dangerous people. Their God-given talent, their ability to work out the earth, to develop and submit it in accordance with what God had commanded Adam to do in the Garden of Eden. That is true. But this can have violent consequences with this lineage because of their sinful and unrepentant nature. They start in inventing and developing tools to cultivate the earth, to forge. And one day, they will end up producing weapons of mass destruction, chemical warfare. The other son of Lamech, Jubal, would make another contribution to human civilization. He would become the father of musicians, also very gifted people who, who can weather glorify God with their art, as David did with the Psalms, or worship Satan with that same art, with music made to accompany demonic rituals. And can we deny that we see something at work in, in many, much of music that goes on commercial radios and, and, and with certain groups and, and certain words and lyrics that we hear? Lamech, coming from Cain, is a man filled with an instinct of revenge, an urge and a will to dominate. He knows very little about right and justice. A single wife is not enough for him. In direct disobedience with the initial commandment of God, he brings polygamy in his life and in the course of human history. He takes Ada and Sila as wives. And listen to this. The Lord had brought a measure of protection on his ancestor Cain by giving a warning to anyone who would want to kill Cain. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken sevenfold. Why sevenfold? That is according to the perfect measure of God's just judgment, which is measured by the symbolic number seven. Because the Lord still wanted to make of Cain an instrument to populate the earth. That was in line with the commandment he had given uh, to the first couple to multiply and fill the earth. So Cain's life had to be preserved. And if someone would attempt to his life, he had to be avenged uh, sevenfold. It, his life had to be protected, even though 
he was the murderer of his brother Abel. And you must notice here that if La Mer speaks the way he speaks, it's because what happened to his ancestor has also been transmitted to him. There has been a transmission about this event of Cain and what God said to Cain. La Mer knows what God said to Cain. Just like the other La Mer understand what was the curse that was brought on earth. But what does this La Mer do with, uh, 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 with this uh, uh, protection? He, for, for La Mer, the warning of God is not enough. He will kill someone who only injured him. He will not let the Lord take care of a sevenfold revenge. He will himself exercise it 77 times more. And mind you, he has the means to do it because he has sons and grandsons who can make weapons for him if he asks them to do so. You see, it was precisely to prevent and to forbid this instinct and impulse of violence that the Lord would determine in his law the well-known commandment, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, which we read in Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. It was done, given, so that a criminal action would only be punished in the exact proportion of the harm caused to the victim, not 77 times more. I use as an illustration this uh, uh, some of these road rage addict people in South Africa, a country where I've lived 26 years, and some of them, a few, I will say everyone, fortunately, but they put on the back of their car a sticker with the following words. You scratch my car, I smash your face. And now, we are arriving on point three of our outline, if you wonder where I am with my sermon. The beginning of chapter 6, a bit later, mentions to us that the two lineages crossed each other. They crossed each together at a given point in time. When man began to multiply, now it came to pass, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, this expression, the sons of God, it has been understood in several ways, but many exegetes understand it as meaning the lineage of Seth, those who remained faithful to God, those who exercised true worship. And that is also, uh, I understand it, because the whole passage taken in its context favors this understanding, as we shall see. And these intermarriages between the line of Seth and the line of uh, 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 Cain bring about more corruption on earth. Why? Somehow because the influence of Cain's descendants on the descendants of Seth becomes determining. The lineage of Cain takes over the lineage of Seth in terms of mindset, mentality. And you know what? This is particularly the case with Noah's brothers and sisters. It will be a constant motive of warnings and judgment for the people of Israel. The people of God's covenant always begins exercising false worship because of this type of human covenants and marriages with pagan nations. Oh, think, for instance, of Moab in the time of Bileam. Think of the consequence of Salomon's marriages with pagan princesses, but uh, Salomon had a bit more than Ada and Sila, not just two. In total, that makes about 1,000, I believe. In Genesis 6, the corruption takes such proportions that the Lord says, Scripture, the Lord is sorry that He made man on the earth, mankind. He is sorry. 
It is even said in verse 6 that it grieved him to his heart. It's astonishing words. Mankind became so corrupt that the Lord decided to blot out man from the face of the land, except for a very small group of people coming from the line of Seth, the righteous Noah and his family. And as I hinted earlier, not one from Noah's brothers and sisters escaped the flood. Where do you see Noah's brothers and sisters? They are not even mentioned. Oh, well, yes, they are mentioned. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. Were they not brothers and sisters of Noah? And there were many, and they were all blotted out. None of them escaped the flood. So Lamech, the believer this time, did not live in long, long enough to see that the only comfort which Noah would bring would be to escape this terrible judgment with his wife, three sons and, and their wives. Because if you keep counting the years, as Scripture gives them to us, I don't invent this, Lamech died at the end of 70, uh, 777 years. Uh, years of age, only five years before the Lord brought the flood on earth. And who knows, that is not said. Someone will say, you speculate, Domine. But Lamech may have seen his son Noah building the ark, understanding that something was going to happen. In any case, all these other descendants who were mixed with the line of Cain and along with them had become so corrupt, they were all destroyed by the flood. So where is the hope of poor Lamech? Is it, was it going to be realized at the time of his son? One day, one day, a unique descendant of Seth and of Lamech from that line thus, Lamech the believer, a unique descendant would come on earth. And you see, speaking of genealogies, it's so important to relate Scripture and compare Scripture with Scripture, which is, normally speaking, uh, 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 a foundational, fundamental way of uh, expounding Scripture uh, if it's to give right to uh, the, the whole message. We need to go and refer to the genealogy that we read in chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke. That because it concerns this one descendant from that line. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years old. Being the son as, the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Levi. And so Luke goes now, Unlike uh, Matthew that goes downwards with a genealogy, Luke goes upwards. And he names all the links and he ends up with the generational links that are given to us in Genesis chapter 5. Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamer, the son of Metushelah, the son of Enoch, this famous Enoch that was taken to heaven, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalaleel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, he is the new Adam, who as a man came out of a particular line of believers which include Seth, Enoch, Lamech, Noah, Abraham, David, many others. The true and final comfort which Noah's father expected at the time of his birth, and which he didn't see in such a way, the true and final comfort would become fulfilled much later with the birth of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. On earth, he would reflect 
perfectly the image of God. As we read in the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Jesus came to repair the tremendous damage which Satan caused in the image of God by bringing Adam into rebellion against his Creator. You see, coming back to the beginning of chapter 5, we read that in the day that God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. That's what we read already in chapter 1 of Genesis. 1, 26 to 28, is it not? But just a bit later, Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness after his image, and he named him Seth. But you see, the image and likeness between Adam and his son Seth that did not bear any more the perfect character of the image and likeness between God and Adam on the day of his creation. It is said that it was in the likeness and the image, but it was not the same character of the same image anymore. The image of God in mankind was and is still there, but it is so defiled. It is so polluted that it becomes at times impossible to recognize it. We see it when we are convinced of our own sins by the Holy Spirit. We see it in our own lives. We sit outside. Uh, we sit in society. We see it, for instance, in the case of the other Lamech, the promoter of polygamy and revenge, a man without any self-restraint, guided only by his corrupt instinct of, of what we call hubris. Hubris meaning a will to dominate, a man exercising violent domination instead of peaceful dominion. There is a big difference between exercising domination and exercising dominion. What God commanded Adam and Eve to do was to exercise dominion. But after the fall, what mankind wants to do is to exercise domination and even violent domination, as this Lamer uh, 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 showed. But Jesus, a man descended from a line of people who put their hope in God, he came to wash out this stain. He came to restore in us the image of God which received such a blow. So, along with the fathers of the Synod of Nicaea in the 4th century, we can confess, for us men and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, and He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and He was made man. Yes, He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and He was made man for the sake of of the restoration of God's perfect image in us when we are grafted in His life through faith. And this is done through the working of the Holy Spirit, which the confession also calls the giver of life, the life giver, and it is done under His guidance because the Holy Spirit applies in our lives the perfect work of the new Adam. The Spirit rebuilds our lives which have been brought back from death by the blood of the perfect Lamb of God. Yes, our lives are saved from the destruction brought about by the flood. Our lives are saved from a certain death while our sins have been crucified with Jesus on the cross, buried, drowned. They have been drowned. They have been put to death so that we may now live a true life in Christ in obedience to the will of God. Is it not exactly the meaning of our baptism, brothers and sisters, in the holy name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And now we can look at a new look on life in Christ, which is the fifth point in the outline. 
just think of it. How did Jesus, the new Adam, the true Son of Man and the true Son of God, how did he respond to the revenge speech of Lamech, the one who had two wives? In Matthew chapter 18, from verse 21, we read, Then Peter, his disciple Peter, came to him, came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Hmm. Do you hear, brothers and sisters, the voice of the new Adam? The descendant of Seth, not descended from Cain. But here is the question for you, for each of us this afternoon. In which lineage do we situate ourselves? That's a difficult question. We sit on the pew of the church, perhaps very faithfully. But do we breed inside ourselves feelings of revenge, of bitterness, feelings of violence, or lust? Do we love to exercise domination instead of dominion? Are we prepared to forgive? Do we put our comfort and hope in the God of grace who delivered us from eternal death through His Son? who can and wants to accomplish miracles in our lives? Are we building our lives on the right foundation, on the new Adam? Or, without us knowing, while we keep sitting on the pew Sunday after Sunday, are we progressively becoming estranged from the new Adam? Are we joining the lineage of Cain? The day of reckoning is approaching quickly. Mind you, every day brings us closer to this day, to this great day. The Son of God, the new Adam, is on His way. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, to separate forever the line of true believers from the line of unbelievers. In Matthew chapter 24, from verses 37 to 42, Jesus warns His audience very clearly. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, uh, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware, totally unaware. They thought everything was fine until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. My brother, my sister, please go back home with this thought. Do not forget about it a single moment in your life. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. From the same lineage, from the same family. Who knows? Perhaps from the same church. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Yes, our Lord is coming, and we do not know which day will come. But is it not so that we pray intensely for His coming, that we may finally be delivered from the side effects of sin which are still felt so heavily in our lives? At the very end of the New Testament, in the last verses of the book of Revelation, Jesus confirms His second coming while his bride, the church, assents to his words and prays always intensely that they may quickly be fulfilled. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, our Father, your word is sharper as a double-edged sword. It goes into the bones and cuts through the marrow and uh, displays even the most secret thoughts. There is nothing that lay hidden before you, Lord. Our thoughts and our lifestyle, you know it all. And uh, you bring us a warning through your word. Where do we belong? In which lineage do we find ourselves? Do we educate our children as well? Are we serious with this? Are we faithful to your covenant, Lord? May your Holy Spirit help us day after day to set our priorities right, to put our thoughts and our words where they belong, not where the word world wants to have them. We pray very specially for your church persecuted throughout the world, for here too, in many countries, there are descendants of Seth and Noah and Abraham by faith who belong to you. And they are persecuted by these descendants of this other line, of the line of Cain, just as he murdered Abel, his own brother. Lord, we see this, we hear it in the news, or we know it is happening. And we also want to pray, Lord, for those who at the moment belong to the lineage of Cain and persecute others or are estranged from you, that you will transfer them by the powerful gospel that you have given us, given mankind, that you will transfer them into the other lineage, that they will come, become part of your church, of your people, Lord, for nothing is impossible to you. Did you not bring to his knees a certain soul of Tarsus who was persecuting the church at the very beginning of her existence? Did you not make of him the first great missionary, your apostle? Did you not inspire his letters that he wrote through your spirit? If you are able to do that, Lord, we may not doubt that you can do it for other, many other people, but let us not forget to pray for these persecutors as well. We also pray for the authorities in our country here in Canada. We pray also as a, an election is coming soon that whoever will come to uh, in office will set his or her mind and attention to establish laws that would reflect your justice and your righteousness for the good of the country. Lord, be with us in the rest of this day and make us always attentive to what you have to teach us. We ask these things in the name of the new Adam, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now turn to hymn number 379. 379, that is our um, song of application. And um, it is, Come, Christians, join to sing. We sing all three verses of song number 379.
Let us pray. Lord, uh, our Father in heaven, as we are about to bring our offering to you, we pray that this would be an offer pleasant to you and uh, that it would serve to glorify your name and uh, uh, be used for what you have purported it to be used, Lord. Uh, bless this time of offering. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 